Okay, <clears throat> I just made a little video of some of the pictures. <clears throat> so, um, my name is Kate Painter. I'm an extension educator at the University of Idaho in uh, Boundary County, about two hours north of here. And uh, I've done in three years, we've done a farm to table fundraiser with our, for our local community garden. And when I first started doing them, there was no information I could find on how to do a farm to table dinner. Has anybody here been involved in one? Or just you have? Have you eaten that one? And you? Um, yeah, eaten that one. Good. <coughs> They're fun. Yes, they are. So being an educator um, and noticing that people are starting to do them and wanting to do them on their farm, I felt a real need to try to get some information out to, uh, before I keep going, am I loud enough or should I be speaking in the mic? Mic, okay, so you're recording it. Okay, even though you're all just right here in front of me, let me talk in the mic. So I just felt there was some public health information that I needed to share before people started doing farm to table dinners. Should I talk further back? How about that? Okay, thank you. Um, I, I just felt there was some information I needed to share and also I felt like we learned a lot. Um, we came up with a lot of tricks, I think. And I also see that there's a lot more information out there about doing a farm to table dinner. So um, <clears throat> I guess I need to stand back here so I can move the slides forward. But um, if you've got any questions, just a small group or comments, just please say something. <clears throat> I, the slideshow that I had there was from our our fundraiser, which we do at the fairgrounds. And um, we kind of came up with all these different tricks to make it a good, successful fundraiser. And because we're a nonprofit, the community garden is a nonprofit organization, we actually were um, um, exempted from having to do the um, <clears throat> temporary and intermittent uh, food establishment guidelines permitting process. However, the last thing in the world we wanted to do was to have someone be sick or not follow the rules since it's university sponsored. So um, <clears throat> I did take the food handler's permit class and do all these other things just trying to make sure I knew the rules and also just to get really familiar so I could help other farmers who wanted to do this um, follow the rules and know what you need to do and not incur some big liability. So around the country, farmers, farm to table dinners are increasingly popular. They're also great uh, besides just for agritourism, they, they uh, are a good way to you do a fundraiser. The one we had last summer at Roniger's Organics was for raising money for playground equipment. They felt kind of guilty about trying to raise money for their own farm. <laughs> they thought that looked selfish, so instead they decided all the profits after they paid their expenses would go towards new playground equipment for the elementary school in Bonners Ferry. But it also was incredibly good exposure and uh, people loved it and it got them a lot more customers. So you can combine promoting your farm with some other cause for greater good that you're interested in. <clears throat> so definitely you're gonna connect your producers and consumers. People love it. Um, it educates them about their food supply and it helps promote local products. One thing that um, Roniger's Organics, I have a lot of photos from their farm to table which was just absolutely spectacular last summer that I went to, um, is they could have been selling. They could have been selling their winter box, which is they grow vegetables, taking orders. And I'm gonna recommend that they do. I work with them pretty closely because I would have bought one. I think they could have sold a lot of them there. I, they were a little bit shy about promoting themselves and people wanted to buy stuff. <clears throat> so the farm to table dinners, people have pretty high expectations. They're usually fairly expensive and they expect a gourmet dinner. Um, definitely local, fresh in ingredients, 
often with the presiding chef. Um, well, when we started doing this, we thought, well, hey, this will be good. We'll just make up a menu. It was a lot harder than we thought, a lot, lot harder. And it is really great if you can find a, a chef. One example and one of the resources that I have at the end of the PowerPoint, um, they found a chef who was willing to be in charge for a nominal fee. He had the liquor license, which is critical that you have a liquor license. And he said, I will just take the proceeds from the cash bar. <laughs> That's my tip for doing this. So, uh, but it is really great if you have some friends who are really, have a lot of experience and who are good cooks. Because you're going to have to be flexible. If some crop that you plan to grow in the spring for your dinner doesn't grow because you have a very cold year like we did, um, we actually ended up getting a whole bunch of eggplant from a friend who lives further south. <laughs> <laughs> because our eggplant just didn't produce like we were hoping. So anyway, um, the main thing I wanted to talk about besides just all the planning and the details and some of the tricks is the potential pitfalls um, from food safety regulations to liability. I, so my, uh, the, my farmers that I work with, my, um, the Ronigers, when they went to our, our local health district, the guy there told him, ah, you don't need a permit. It's just like having a wedding. Does that sound right to you? It's not because it's open to the public and they're selling tickets. Who pays to go to a wedding? It's $60 <laughs> so, for a ticket. And so um, that was not good information. So I'm trying to up the, the quality of the information that gets out to my farmers as well. I talked to the um, state level health district folks and said, hey, we need, we need better information because You've got vulnerable populations that attend a dinner. An older person, maybe somebody who's sick, um, they maybe don't have the robust gut of the young people who work on that farm, and they need to be following food health safety regulations, plus the liability. You could lose your farm if somebody hurt themselves badly, or you know, you just, you gotta make sure you dot your I's and cross your T's, and um, then it can be great, but that's what I'm trying to, um, tell people about. So um, there's a lot of details. It has taken an incredible amount of time to do our annual fundraising farm to table dinners. I hate to even think about it. Um, they're really great. Everybody loves them, but it's a real, um, there's just a lot of details. It's almost like planning a wedding. In fact, I think it's kind of like planning a wedding and you can get some really good ideas if you Google outdoor weddings for your farm to table. <laughs> Um, but there's a lot of information on, there's a lot and a lot of information online too for just ideas. Uh, the main thing is just the right venue and you figure, well, it's just, we're just going to have it at the farm. There's a lot of problems there because you've got to keep your hot food hot, your cold food cold, you've got the weather, you've got dirt, um, you've got uneven ground, you've got bathrooms. Our community garden, therefore, even though it would be beautiful to have it there, won't work for all those reasons. We have a porta potty. We've got no electricity. There's no way we could do it there. Um, and so you do need just the right venue and everybody complains and we do it at the fairgrounds because we haven't found a better venue. <clears throat> There's wedding places out on people's farms and of course they all are very expensive. We're trying to make money. So um, anyway, and then the licenses and permits and those will vary. And so there's no reason for me to tell you what works in Boundary County because you probably aren't from Boundary County. You'll have to find your own. Um, there is a really good piece of information that was put out for Oregon, how to develop successful farm to table dinners. This was the best um, little flyer that I could find. And it is also in the resources. It's from Oregon Farm Loop, which is a agritourism um, site, Mary Stewart. Anyway, um, very useful. And she talks about licenses and permits in Clackamas County. You gotta go to your own county and your own health district. And the other thing is thinking about, you'll have to think about is marketing and sales. Where I'm gonna go through all these things in a little more detail. Um, of course, the main thing people want is local ingredients. And you may not have all the local ingredients available. Um, you're gonna have to prepare your farm to host. I, do any of you live on farms? Are they prepared and clean and tidy for the public to show off every day? Oh my goodness. This person's more like me. I'm like, uh-uh. 
I had a I had a farm near Colfax, Washington. I had a sheep farm and had a shearing day celebration. That was about the only time I had big thing at my farm, and that was a huge cleanup project. I just don't want to be embarrassed by things, you know. Took fresh bales of straw and spread them all over the floors, all over the barn, and you know, they don't want people stepping in poop or something, you know, it's just not going to be impressive in, in any way. It, it does, most farms, because people are so busy, do need a, some sprucing up, and they may need some infrastructure as well. <clears throat> you do need to check with your insurance, your liability insurance, and make sure a one-time event will be okay. Make sure you don't need some sort of rider. Um, sadly, you're probably going to have to have commercial kitchen facilities or work with a caterer or chef. You can't just do it in your kitchen. So you end up learning a lot when you start looking through these rules. You know, and like our, our one that we had last summer in our, in our um, that one was probably okay because they had a local restaurant make a lot of the food and bring it out. The only thing that wasn't done in commercial kitchen facilities was her salad mix. And she prepares those and sells them in the local grocery stores anyway, so she has very good, um, you know, follows Gap and all that. But you can just imagine that this is important and that's why the public health rules are like they are. Restroom facilities, they ended up renting porta potties and uh, kind of rigging together little hand washing facilities. You've got to have something, especially on a farm. People often want to see the animals, see the animals eat, see the animals eat. Yeah, you've got some hand washing issues. Parking, you know, you're going to probably have to have signage for parking, uh, level ground, you may have to even go and um, you know do some mowing or whatever. I think another thing that people are so busy when they're putting on a farm to table is that they don't have the enough signage and people that come at different times, they don't know what they're supposed to do or where they're supposed to go. So you kind of need parking signs, enter here, you've arrived <laughs> kind of signage. And then the, one of the hardest things, of course, is planning for the weather. That's a given. So you may have to have a fallback for rain. You don't want people sitting outside in the rain. And yet people want to sit outside. That's the fun part. So what do you do? Tent, backup plan. And tents, good, nice, nice tents are expensive to rent. Another thing that was important that we finally got was a sound system. I really wanted to have a program where some of our local producers were talking about things, we're talking about the farmer's market, some other interesting stuff, and we needed a sound system. So now, it was actually pretty inexpensive, a portable sound system. Okay, so um, I'm sure you're familiar with characteristics of a farm-to-table dinner. It is really a type of culinary tourism held on a farm. And you're going to have the, they want elegance and yet they also want rustic settings. So how do you do that? It is a really kind of a creative, fun, visually interesting uh, problem. Here's a beautiful setting here. Um, they really want the real life personalities of the farmers, the chefs, winemakers maybe to bring authenticity to the event and tell their stories. So um, there's a lot of appeal. There's a lot of reasons to want to do this. You kind of have some sort of decor that's a mix of fresh Northwest and French country, slow food style. So hopefully you've got somebody who's good with decorations. Um, so these are pictures from the uh, Ronegers Organics Farm to Table and they have couple long tables, you can't see that, they were a little bit different heights, and some benches, some straw bills covered with blankets, um, and it was kind of smoky, you know how we have our smoky summers now, but it, it, it wasn't too smoky, so I just kind of felt like I was in a dream, I was in heaven, it was like <laughs> just a magical experience. Even though I'd been there before, it just, it just seemed amazing. And so I was going to talk about what makes a successful situation, and this does not, because we are very isolated in Boundary County, and this farm is even more isolated than Bonners Ferry. Um, it makes it easy to have a farm to table if you've got a strong ag economy located close to an urban population center like Spokane or 
from Seattle, a lot of you are from Seattle. If you've already got agritourism like Green Bluff or other scenic attractions, often they might tie a farm to table dinner in with something else like a, a bike, you know, a bike ride or a river ride, you know, rafting or something like that to have a part of another event. And this had none of that. Um, an area with a st strong interest in local food or restaurant culture. We don't have that. We've got a couple choices of restaurants that are open not all week. So why was it <laughs> successful? Um, it was successful because it was for the elementary school and they wrote to all the graduates of the elementary school back. They had their addresses from 30 years and said, we're doing this fundraiser for Valley View Elementary and to raise playground money for playground equipment. And so talking to the people that were there, they were like, wow, I got this letter and hey, what a good excuse and I love this. So it was a compelling reason. Um, and they had a list of people to contact. So yeah, definitely we were in a more challenging situation and it was fairly small. Did you see that? There was like 28 people total. 26 or 28. So that's actually a pretty good number. We aimed for 100 at our farm to table dinner, the three that we've had, and we had 100, then 120. That was crazy. And then last year we had 90. That was just a lot better than 120. At least I'm not a cook, but it's just really stressful. I'm a gardener, but not a cook. So um, yeah, it's going to be more challenging off the beaten track, but I don't think that should stop you, didn't stop them. Um, definitely we're in a less affluent region without a strong restaurant culture. It's this beautiful area though, if you ever get up north into Boundary County on your way to Canada, you will be amazed at how gorgeous it is. And we don't have a lot of local production of food and beverage items. They grow root vegetables and greens. And so we had a pretty creative dinner using those things and um, some other lovely, lovely homemade things like bread. So it sold out. That was the Ronegers dinner and it was, had a really beautiful um, graphic look to it. And as you can see it, um, the setting is lovely. If you decide you're gonna do one of these, I think the most important thing is to think about what, why? You know, what are your goals? Is it to introduce your farm to your current customers? Is it to gain new customers? Maybe it's a thank you for your customers. Maybe you wanna make money. Um, there are farms in our area that are starting to do this to make money um, and they're not being shy about it. Um, maybe it's to start a new enterprise on your farm. Maybe you want it, people are like, what? You should have one of these every month because we love to come out here to go to dinner. So you could, I think you really could do it. And when uh, someone said that to Marquis Roniger, she just was like, oh my God, that's how I feel too. It's a lot of work on top of a busy life. Um, but it could garner support for your products. Their, their produce is amazing. And uh, man, I was really impressed. Uh, and. I really hadn't ventured into some of their different root products. It can be quite profitable, um, depending on how you do it, but it could also be a financial disaster if you don't do a lot of planning. Um, so you've got to really start ahead, a long way ahead of time. And um, especially go to your health district early on. Some of those have some early deadlines. And you might find out that you actually can't do it. It's not going to work because you can figure out some of the, the hoops you have to jump through. If you're gonna grow the crops, particularly for the dinner, if you're gonna have 100 people, of course, you're gonna have to think way ahead. There were some things when we decided we wanted an Italian theme this year, some things I wanted to grow that there was like fennel. We didn't have enough time to grow fennel still. Um, and if you're gonna have to have some facility upgrading, that can be a significant cost like restrooms or a commercial kitchen facility, some sort of basic cleanup and rebuilding that you may want to do so you're going to have to plan ahead. We've been kind of investing in ours as time goes on. The first two years, we got all the board members from our community garden to bring their own china and we set each table up with different place settings. That's asking a lot to take your own china and then take it back home and wash it. Now we actually have um, clear glass plates and they look really nice 
even though they're just dollar store, they're all the same, they stack pretty well. So we're just slowly making investments in cloth napkins and stuff like that. Um, but it's nice if you can find a place to rent or borrow some of those. Um, probably one of the most important things is to check your liability insurance. Um, find out, maybe you, you don't have one, but most farms that have some sort of agritourism do. And just to make sure that a one-time event is covered and um, you know you don't want somebody breaking a leg and wanting that to you know to be paid for and not having insurance. So um, let's just talk for a minute about marketing and sales logistics. Are you going to have to spend a bunch of money on marketing? We spend a bit of money on marketing and just get posters, put them up all over. We wish we had a big sign, you know, big banner, but we haven't been able to afford one of those. Uh, and then we have tickets that match. I think this is an example of the ticket. I mean, do you already have a loyal base or will you do quite a bit of marketing to get customers? One thing that I keep doing very poorly is to gather all the names and email addresses of the people that come. We, um, we, we met with our, you saw the FFA kids in the beginning movie. We use them for servers. Of course, they're not trained servers, but they do do a couple fundraising dinners themselves throughout the year, so they have a little training. And they look so cute in their official dress, and so everybody just is like, oh my god, we love our FFA kids, aren't they, darling? And uh, they are, they have really good manners, and um, this year, actually, we branched out and had the robotics team also being servers. It just makes it all a good community feeling. Um, <clears throat> I got off topic there, what was I going to say? The FFA kids do some fundraising dinners, so I met with the director there and asked for some hints, and he said, you know, have pieces of paper where you ask people while they're waiting, while they're sitting through the program, waiting for their dinner, to put their contact information, any feedback on it, then save those pieces of paper so that you've got contact information. It always seems like by the end of the, the night, when we're cleaning things up, before you know it, all those pieces of paper have disappeared. So somehow you need to put them in a basket for a raffle drawing or something to gather those. That is a, kind of a bad thing to keep not doing a better job. I'm sure you've all used some of these services like Eventbrite or Brown Paper Tickets where people can um, buy their tickets and then you've got all their information and you can keep getting them updates and everything's electronic. We use that. Um, but we also, we sell a lot more of them, just uh, we sell them at the extension office and a local bookstore and just regular old tickets seems to be in our community. People prefer that. It's a little cheaper. You know, one thing, don't forget to look at your Chamber of Commerce. Some agritourism websites may be helpful. It seems to me in some parts of the country, they've got some really great websites for farmers that list all the agritourism and be happy to put your farm to table on a website. I put mine on Facebook and on our university website and different places like that, but I don't know. One of my biggest struggles being an extension educator is getting the word out, and I'm sure everybody else would have that same struggle. So it seems like you need flyers, you need it online, you need an email list, you need to be mentioning it at Rotary. I don't know. It just has to be kind of multi, multimedia to get the word out. Yeah. From Washington Farm Bureau, we have a website called farmfresh.org. It's farmfreshwashington.org. Um, and if you've got uh, an event that you'd like publicized, we'll put it on our event calendar. Great. So that's the whole idea of the, the website. <coughs> Farmfresh. And that's the Farm Bureau. Yeah. It, it's, uh, it's to connect producers with uh, the consumer. That is fantastic. I'm not sure if Idaho has something like that. Do you know if other states do? Maybe I could tell them to go look at your website and copy it for Idaho. We need to do a lot more of that. Yeah, and then the other thing, are you going to also be marketing something else at the dinner as well? It might be a, a good time. Um, and if you're going to do that, and then again, you've got your logistics of payment and pickup and all that. One of, the, one of the bottlenecks we have is people coming at, to the door with their tickets or their Eventbrite receipts. And it's, 
Um, all of a sudden you realize there's 50 people in line, that's ridiculous. So we are trying to make that better, Just really trying to make that not happen, at least have them getting hors d'oeuvres. <laughs> it shouldn't take so long to check people in. So that's why it's better to just check them in quickly and then have them, if you want some sort of sign in, do it with individual pieces of paper at the table or something. So um, I, there are a lot of catering type organizations, farm to table catering. I know there's even a, a guy in, um, I think he's here in Spokane that I met, Spokane Accord Lane that has a farm to table catering. Like he does it for weddings, he'll, he will um, figure out what's available fresh and local and then create your menu around that. So um, it is really nice to have some professional help they typically have access to commercial kitchens, liquor licenses, liability insurance. So it may just make your life easier if this is the part that is uh, hard for you. Uh, definitely this is the part that's hard for me. It's making a, a menu that everything goes well together. Especially if I think I have to have the pressure of being fancy. I feel like I'm a pretty good down home regular cook, but to be gourmet is a lot of pressure. Another thing that's a little tough is having experienced staff or waiting tables and serving. And you, in Idaho, you really need your food handler's um, license. You can do that online. It takes a little over an hour. Um, or you can do it, it, they're usually free, so kids that work at Jack in the Box or wherever, they need their food handler's permit. It's really good basic information. We all decided we needed to go online and take it. We figured we could do it pretty quick. It's gotta be basic. It's a little more than basic. You know, you got your safe temperature ranges that things have to stay in and your time, they test you on all that. Um, it's not a bad idea to try to get everyone to at least go online and do that. Some of the other logistics that a chef or caterer could help you with may be access to dinnerware, linen, tables, chairs, umbrellas, tents, decor, those warming and chafing dishes, those hot, hot holding things, grills, cookware, servingware, it ends up, you know, if you're doing very many people, that's kind of been a bottleneck for us, is access to all those things. Although being at the fairgrounds, that's a pretty good spot for getting tables and chairs and commercial kitchen facilities. That's why we go there. Uh, <clears throat> so yeah, even better if you have a chef or caterer who specializes in farm-to-table menus. Maybe that's an area that some people might be interested in going into. So here's a drone photo of the Ronegers Organic Farm in uh, northern Idaho. And uh, just wanted to say that these public health regulations, in Idaho we have public health districts. I don't know if any of you are from Idaho, but um, that's kind of what you need to look for is your public health district for maybe the county level, um, and maybe even zones within your county that will differ. Um, <clears throat> you typically must have a permit if you're going to hold an event that is open to the public. Uh, Nonprofits in Idaho that do not serve or prepare food on a regular basis may be exempt from obtaining a permit. You know how at the fair you have people doing those uh, elephant ears and stuff? That's, they have to follow all these rules. Temporary and intermittent food establishment guidelines. This is the Idaho Bible on this topic. <clears throat> so contact those guys first. Um, it's going to vary, and um, in Idaho you have to do it at least three weeks in advance, but you want to go way ahead of then so that you have an idea, like we did, that unless we went to the fairgrounds that had the commercial kitchen and everything else, we wouldn't be falling within their guidelines. And we wanted to follow within their guidelines even though we didn't have to get a permit. We just didn't want any problems. And they're going to ask you what kind of food will you be serving, how will it be prepared, how will you keep hot food hot and cold food cold. You can't just use a crock pot, they're not allowed. So before you start the process, go find out what the rules are so you can work around it. Um, so most states are going to require that the meals be prepared in a commercial kitchen. You can't just do it on the farm. They can be finished and plated at the farm, and some can be prepared at the farm. But you're going to have to work with someone. Typically, you get an individual, an environmental health specialist, who will look at the situation and figure out what you can and can't do. 
the one we had in Boundary County said, no problem, don't worry about it, but I don't think that was very good advice. Okay, so um, will you work with a restaurant? That's one way to do it, or a caterer to prepare the food off-site, so you take the food from the farm and have them prepare it. Um, do you have a commercial kitchen area? That's a bottleneck for most people. Do not have a commercial kitchen. That's a big investment. Um, so you've got all these requirements. You're going to have to have a thermometer and keep things. You only can keep them out for so many hours within a temperature range. You have to throw everything away after a certain period of time. That's not going to be an issue because you're probably going to be serving it all at once. But um, anyway, I already mentioned that. How are we doing? 1206. And I think the last thing anybody wants is some sort of foodborne illness. And it actually happens quite often, uh, more often than we realize. And it's typically because someone's sick, lack of hand washing, improper cooking, improper holding temperatures, food from an unsafe source, unsafe source, or contaminated equipment. Uh, the extension educator who does this topic in my office always does this one uh, clip of a woman who um, was in the hospital and almost died from eating a baked potato that had, um, I'm trying to remember, what, botulism from a, in a baked potato. Unbelievable. They're actually uh, a potentially hazardous food. There's a list of potentially hazardous foods and foods that they don't worry about so much, but baked potatoes can be bad. Another thing people kind of expect is alcohol. And as you can imagine, there's lots of rules governing that. What's really nice is if your chef or caterer um, has a liquor license, what we do for our farm to table dinner at the fairgrounds is um, we give free tickets to a local brewer who has a liquor license, who has a brewery in Bonners Ferry. So he and his wife get free tickets and they like to be supportive anyway. So they come and they set it up and they are the um, liquor license of record for the event. It's still, they are kind of laissez-faire about that. And so the first year or two, things were just kind of like people were serving themselves. You can't put a bottle on the table. They have to walk up and be served because somebody with a liquor license has been trained to make sure that you're not feeding somebody, giving someone more alcohol that's had too much. Of course, they got to drive home. So that kind of thing. We ended up, um, even though we wanted the alcohol to be included as part of the ticket, we gave them little red tickets, you know, raffle ticket things. You get two free drinks with your ticket. We didn't really monitor that people might be trading it. But before we did that, too many times people were going up and up and up and up and bringing drinks back for the whole table. And we went through an incredible amount of wine. So. Using the tickets just made people realize that they should really only have two drinks. It really was good enough. And then we can't sell it, but if you wanted to have more than you were supposed to donate. So it wasn't perfect. It definitely um, could probably be improved, but you hate to be have to be a real um, rule follower when you're trying to have a nice time. And just having those tickets for two drinks, managed to, I think, avoid the problem. Yeah. Have you done some events that did not include alcohol? And what was your interest in those versus the ones that didn't do as much as the alcohol? That is a really good question. People really liked having the alcohol. So we've talked about different venues, and some of those venues you can't have alcohol. Like, as our community garden is on the church grounds. And we, if we had the dinner there, which would be kind of fun because you could walk over to the garden, we couldn't serve alcohol. Same with like the senior center. So all these venues, you couldn't have alcohol. And we're thinking, well, maybe we should do one without out alcohol. There'll be some people that wouldn't like it, but I think some people wouldn't care. I don't know how it would go. I guess we're kind of afraid to try it. Yeah, I was curious because we, um, you know, at our farm, we would not have alcohol. Uh-huh. Maybe you knew of someone who had kind of 
still had success with these hard bidders and yet perhaps allocated other fun drinks that would be a kind of featured item replacing? I think you could. You might get a little different crowd, but you might have, we were thinking, well, it would be more family friendly. And if we had it at the church with the garden there, just to shake it up, we're actually thinking of a lot of different ideas. We try to do something different every year to bring in maybe different people. Like we were thinking of having an Iron Chef contest where we had the ingredients and people did more of hors d'oeuvres. They love the mixing around, and then we sell a lot at the silent auction. And so they like to just wander around and eat the hors d'oeuvres parts. And by the time we actually serve the meal, people are like, Psh, stuffed, right? So um, I think, you know, with cider or something else, some punch, you would get a different crowd, but you'd get a family-friendly kind of atmosphere going. What do you folks think? Would you be uninterested if there wasn't wine pairings? Well, maybe a luncheon. Or luncheon. Well, you know, it's oddly, we actually had um, a winery come out and do one of their stakeholder dinner brunches, thinking, oh, it's going to be a moot point. I'm not going to have to have that wine discussion. Brunch, though. And it was there, and it was, um, you know, it was awkward. Oh. You know, Uh -huh. Our just personal conviction, marketing and the way you market the event, I think the challenge I could see is that a lot of these events are marketed as like upscale, classy, nights out, and people in our culture just associate that with alcohol. I know, and I, I mean, and I have nothing like against that at all, but our friends are winemakers, just at our farm, it's just something that we would like to just change it up a little and not have to, and yet it's a very awkward thing there's a restaurant called Nana, I believe, in Lesson Lake, and they do uh, eight course wine pairing. It's kind of by the table, but it's at the restaurant. But they have an option for people that don't want alcohol and um, just having been a couple of weeks ago. The people without the alcohol enjoys their dinner and the drinks better because he, he's a magician at doing herbal mixtures. So he has yeah. elderberry teas yes, and kind of glitters. Like every course had these beautiful drinks to go with them, just little bits of drinks, and, and everyone wanted to sip the non-alcoholic drinks. So I think it could be just a thing. But I, if I was ever trying to raise money, I would always buy alcohol. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> Think in Walla Walla. I think you go to all the effort, right. and then like, oh, there's no alcohol around. Well, you also have a large enough population. Yeah. You don't need, you know, you don't need a thousand people. You need 50. Right. Yeah. And there's a lot of people that have chosen, you know, they're in AA and they really look for events of that alcohol. It's a lot more comfortable for them. So you'd be appealing to that crowd, and as well as family friendly or people who just don't want to have to deal with it for whatever. So I, I think you shouldn't be afraid, to, especially if it's youth. No, and I think you're right. Don't market it as upscale dinner, as more of a you know, fundraiser for youth, health, earlier in the day, family friendly, and gosh, I, people just love to go to the farm.
And it, it's the event. I, I used to have this thing for shearing day and people came out to do shearing and then we had food, but I never had, I don't think I ever had alcohol because that's not where they came. And I had a farm store and I could not believe, because I was in Colfax, Washington, which is kind of off the beaten path, because I had customers all over the country that how far people would go out of the way to come into my basement to see the farm. It's shocking to me. It's just like, this is just a sheep farm, but they hadn't seen a sheep farm. They wanted to see the sheep and meet me. And so it's about the experience, you know, more than anything. I guess I should watch. We're good. We're good. No, you're fine, actually, because my presentation isn't that long. I was hoping we'd have discussion. So I don't think you should be afraid to have farm to table that isn't around wine. You could have it around this youth thing. I mean, mine was not a farm to table. It was come help me shear and then we're going to eat. And that was kind of secondary. So they loved it. And it was great because I had all this help skirting the fleece, which I needed. And then I'd sell a ton of it right then. My, everybody was so excited about it. But you probably weren't selling tickets for the event. Like you didn't have to worry about all your food handling. Right. right. It was not. It was a free thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. OK. So that's what we were just talking about, wine pairings. And I have seen ones that had a different price structure. So if you didn't want wine, you paid differently. Then you'd have to identify, OK, don't pour wine to this person. But um, you know that's a big cost. And we used Charles Shaw wine, two buck truck, the last two years, because it's a fundraiser. And uh, otherwise, we couldn't afford it. Um, and so a cash bar, that's another way to allocate it. I, we just didn't want anybody getting too drunk. I think the second year we had it, we had way too much alcohol flowing. And a, a few of our board members were like, hey, I saw some problems that could be a liability. And we just didn't want to have that be a liability. So some sort of way that it's not free so people don't have to think they have to drink as much as possible because it's free. Um, yeah, so that's a liability. Um, preparing your farm to host, for me, it was a huge stressful deal because my farm would being two working people with two kids and just, I just felt like it was messy. And so for me, it was kind of stressful to get things nice enough. Um, it's really nice if you have some sort of access through your church or your fairgrounds or whatever to get these kind of things. Um, actually, even just a bunch of the little pop-up tents. That's, we got married in our backyard, which was just kind of a practice for the farm to table. It was 90 people. And we just used a whole bunch of pop-up tents um, got the folding chairs and tables, same ones from the fairground. Um, and we rented a porta potty as well. So it's actually, you could have good guidelines for weddings. Um, <clears throat> but you're going to have to think about your restroom and how that's going to work. Um, parking, some sort of signage, possibly even staffed. Our neighbor kindly kind of staffed the parking for our wedding because there really wasn't great parking. We had to work on that. And you don't want anybody falling, so you're used to your farm. They may not be. Um, they may fall over something. And that brings the last point here. Uh, think about everything that might happen so that you're prepared, whether it's uh, insects bite, allergic reactions, even a heart attack or falls. Um, how would you handle that? If you've already thought about it, um, that would be helpful. Um, Typically, people expect a farm tour, and we definitely had one at the Ronegers. We didn't at the fairgrounds, obviously. Um, they expect farm-like decor and flowers, uh, music or other entertainment. We actually went without that this year because people complained that it was too noisy and they really just wanted to visit. In an outside venue like this one at Ronegers Farm, the music was wonderful. It was a ways enough. You could go listen to it if you wanted, but it didn't really interfere with your, um, with your own talking. It was more background-like. Our sound has always been a little bit of a problem having too many people in a fairground building that doesn't have good acoustics. Um, and I usually have a program because I'm an educator. <laughs> I try to introduce what's going on with our local food system. I guess that's kind of fun. 
Um, we have a silent auction in ours. Uh, that actually has been raising more money than anything else. I think it helps that we serve wine. People get looser <laughs> with their wallets. Um, but having a sort of themed things, farm goods for sale, you know, if you're doing your farm, I think that's a really good time. Looking at the watch here, we're 1220. Um, some kind of party favors is nice, kind of like weddings at the Ronegers. They had just little basil plants for everybody. It was thoughtful. It just meant planning ahead to plant a basil plant. Um, there's Marquis at, um, being the host, doing a farm tour. Um, at, I think, you know, it was their first time. And we kind of felt awkward when we got there. We needed to feel welcomed. And so I think it's important to think um, about, is there somebody there? Get a friend to be the welcomer, the greeter, and tell them what's going to happen. And not everybody arrives at the same time, so you're going to have late people. We actually couldn't find the farm, as I am terrible with directions. And so we got there a little late, and people had already walked off. We didn't know what to do. Um, you do kind of need an agenda and an MC just to think through that. Um, people really want to hear the stories about the food and the menu and the farm. Um, introduce your producers, other guests, the conversation, the friends you make was fantastic. I just had the best time at this fundraiser. And it was expensive. It was $60 per plate. That was a lot. So $120 for me and my husband. And I, we, and I said, well, I really need to go for my research. Plus, it's for the playground equipment, right? So I justified it. Um, and just your typical niceness. I think they were a little bit more shy. But um, making sure that you're thanking everyone and inviting them to return. If you're not a good speaker and you don't like to do that, find somebody that does that well. So there's a lot of benefits. I have seen several photos like this of doing it downtown. That's kind of tempting because it's just, uh, it does not look like fun. The whole town's going to sit down to dinner. But you're going to have to find a restaurant right close by <laughs> to truck all that food over and to serve it. I don't think I talked about serving yet. I, I had it in my notes. But you did see the FFA kids. Um, we needed a lot of servers. The few complaints we got were people saying it took too long for us to get everything. We've messed around with different ways. What, do you plate it up and send out plates? Do you do one table at a time? Do you do it family style? Do you have them walk through a buffet? We did this whole thing by committee, and we spent a lot of time talking about all those different methods. So it's another just kind of detail. We decided that we have not yet stumbled upon the perfect <laughs> answer except for that we needed a lot of servers and somebody directing the kids. So I have worked for the caterers. Yeah, oh, okay. If you work with an experienced caterer, they will hire serving staff based on your number of participants. And those people will be trained by the caterers. Not that there will be hiccups, but that's part of what you're paying for if you go with the caterer usually. That's what we lacked <laughs> was experience in that. So it would probably be good to find a caterer and, and say maybe they would help us since it's for a cause, you know, at least give us some advice. Um, so definitely you could increase your customer base, increase sales, make money for your farm. I think for a cause or for, for a specific thing, maybe your farm needs a commercial kitchen or some sort of upgrade so that you can better participate in the local food system. Um, it helps, I think, to have a particular goal, not just, um, hey, we think we'd like some more money. This one article that I have as a, in the resource guide is um, hosting a successful farm-to-table dinner. It's from the Vermont Farm Share Program. And it helped them be able to offer more farm shares. And I'm not sure if. It almost sounded like they were able to raise money to have like free CSA shares for people who needed it. So um, it wasn't quite clear to me, but they had uh, some really good examples of what a farm was able to do. They made $2,000 net. And that's about what we've made from ours, which is pretty amazing considering we do it for $40 a plate. Um, but we get a lot of generous donations too. And I think it has been really important for my work on my local food system to get uh, more people connected and together. And I've made an online 
an online resource guide using Google Fusion tables. So it makes like a Google map that you can zone in and out of and have little dots where you can click on that and then learn about the farm. So I, I made that guide for Boundary County. It's called bocolocal.com. If you're interested in how to do that, it's, a, it's not real user friendly, but it's not too bad. It's free. Google Fusion Tables. Basically, you make a spreadsheet, and at least a, some dedicated column in the spreadsheet has to be either a, a street, complete street address. What I ended up having to do, because we're remote, is use Latin long. And then it would map it, and you could say what you wanted in the dots to, that you clicked on in the map. So I went from the you know doing the state dinner, getting a lot of local suppliers to making an online guide, and I, I think it's really helped grow our local food system. I've definitely met some great folks who are so busy with their own farms that their nose is to the grindstone, and people are like, you ought to go talk to Paula. She's doing something amazing. So we find about find out about people doing something amazing who are so busy with their own farms that they don't get off the farm. So um, the last slide is the resources. This is being recorded, but if you want a copy of the slides, I'm happy to do that. Um, so there's my contact information, kpainter at uidaho.edu. I'm happy to help. And I think I finished 1227 in time. If there are any questions or comments, we've got a couple minutes. Bo Co, so B O C O, local.com. So that's, that's been a good outgrowth of the farm to table dinners, I think. So you're from the Farm Bureau. Right. I'm not sure how expansive you guys um, are, but if, as me as a farmer who's looking into wanting to have an event at a farm, mm -hmm. I guess I go to my own local county extension office. Is there some like Washington State site that I can go, go to first? To kind of oh, for the Farm Bureau? We're, we're two separate helpful, yeah. They can probably help you with some things and your extension people can help you with some, right? Oh, oh, a different agency altogether. Yeah, 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 yeah. They'll have guidelines I like, they'll, they'll have stuff, they'll probably have stuff on the website, you know, you can download it, but it's easier to talk to a person for sure. What is that called? Green Buck? Oh, okay. Most, most recent yeah. ones from 2014, and I heard they're maybe coming up with an update for 2019. But you can flip over. It, more of it is on regulation on like selling product and what licenses you need to make if you want to make pies and sell them, or if you just want to yeah, sell which is the other component. Yeah, and so I don't know if they have vet specific event topics, but it's a good place to start. It's a really valuable resource. In the exhibit room, yeah, the WASH, okay, WSDA. But you could ask them at their booth as well. All right. Yeah, you got to talk to your local districts for that, or county, or. Yeah, 